We are thankful for your passion and for your drive. We are grateful for the Memory Movement Center that you have created. And we are blessed for the care that you give to the members of our community. So thank you for what you do. And I thank you, Chuck Edwards. Steve's an interesting character. He was real nervous. And if you go in there, 
and we see Steve and he's not sleeping, we know the market's going down. <laughs> if he's well rested, you can feel like it, all your money is going to come. <laughs> then, come fourth generation, I get a call from Phillips who said, Chuck, I want you to uh, talk to Kirby because we'd like him to go to the University of Virginia. And um, I said, well, I don't know if any graduates are going to get into the University of Virginia. <laughs> Unless I write a really good letter. Well, when you saw his application, I had to write one line, and it was. I, I know the guy that brings it in, I said, you have to take him. And they took him. Now, unfortunately, graduated in 2020, Phillips. Are we on that? 22. 22. And, uh, but one of the things for the future, um, I'm kind of embarrassed, but I was in the SAE house, and he came to call me, and he came back. And he told me, that he had joined the SAE house, and I said, oh, my God. <laughs> so um, that's my relationship with the Braggs. Um, one of the things is that, and you already know this, but events like this, interpersonal relationships, sustain us throughout our life. Ben mentioned it just a little bit. Those deep bonds that we have of respect and affection for one another are crucial to lives that matter and lives that work. And my relationship with the Braggs has been one of those things that sustained me. So thank you all. Uh, all right, let's get started. Um, I'm here because I wrote a book. Um, I always think about the words that F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote. He said, you write not because you have something, um, not because you want to say something, but because you have something to say. Tonight, when we're finished, you'll have an idea about whether or not I had something to say. But the book is entitled Much of Eyes. That's from Tennyson, famous poem, um, Ulysses at the end. And I, I underlined, or a subtitle is, um, A Survival Guide for Aging Lives. Now, that's awfully arrogant. I mean, it seems like, you know, some people say, I know there are people here that think, who is this guy? And does he have anything that he can say that's going to have any effect on me? Is there anything he's going to teach me that I don't already know? Well, what I want you to do, I'm going to double down on that arrogance thing. Because if you will open and pay attention to some of the stuff that I say, if you open your heart, open your mind, some of the stuff we're going to go over today has the potential to change your life. So that's how I'm doubling down on this arrogance thing. Uh, what does this burn that heart surgeon have to say? Uh, all right, how I came to write the book. Three things literally collided. I didn't really have the desire to write the book, but I had been through some stuff, and all of a sudden it was almost, it was in my brain, and in order to get it out, I had to get it down on paper. And the three things, the first was, the importance of stories in our life. I come from a long line of Celts. My mother is about as Irish as you can get. She's a Murphy, she's an Ahern. And my father is Scotch Irish. He's a Jackson and Edward Edwards is a rough name. And our family holidays, and any time we got together, were dominated by storytelling. My aunts, my grandma, my grandma could tell a great story. She would use a lot of racy language, but she could tell a great story. And so my brother and I realized that if you didn't have a good story, you weren't going to get to sing. And also it taught us that that's what makes life interesting. That's where the fabric and the excitement comes from, is understanding how other people approach this world, how they manage it. People next door, little lady next door, would be elevated to a hero, and someone that was supposed to be a hero would be diminished. And so I had this desire in my whole life. I've been asking people, uh, "Where are you from? Tell me about yourself." And they, uh, I've had people say all my life, "But you sure ask a lot of questions." <laughs> I apologize. It's just a moment. But this fascination with stories and realizing that we all, every day, of writing our own story and valuing that story was central to my approach in medicine. Uh, the first thing I wanted to know when someone came in was who they were. I wanted to know what they did, and I would just talk to them. In the end, it made me a much better 
diagnostician because I knew them. I knew their family. I knew the things that had happened to them. And so it made me a better doctor. And it made me realize that this person that would come to me, he wasn't just a life without. This was a person. This was a lady that had coronary heart disease, but she has a wife. And what she comes to me for was to fix that coronary heart disease and go back to living that life. This was about her. This wasn't about me. Now, I was supposed to do my part, um, but um, that has been a, a very central part, um, and that's why it's so much fun to, to, to write the things that I've been writing and tell the stories. The second thing was kind of sad because I have a lot of really close friends going through the transition from careers to retirement. Their careers had been sensational. They had, they had, these were lawyers and doctors, and teachers and professors and stuff. And for some reason, I got involved with a lot of their lives. And I realized that these lives had been successful in, in Bountiful. When they started to get near that word that they couldn't even say, the R word, things started to slow down and things started to get a little bit fuzzy. And I saw lives that were magnificent turn and they were in question about how am I going to do this? Um, sometimes the more successful you are, the more, um, and the more identified you are with that success, the harder that you have time adjusting to retirement. And uh, the third thing, um, was the changing career. Uh, Mary Lou talked a little bit about it, but um, one day I was doing a, a case and um, I had a, a pair of forceps in my hand and I had an attention from I had, I had always been really good with my eyes and my hands and um, that kind of threw me off. Um, I knew even then that that was a sign that I wasn't going to be able to operate into my 70s and that because I wasn't going to be that old guy in the ship. I was going to be my thing. So I have to say that um, your brain plays tricks on you um, because events and memories that are put in your brain with emotion and sometimes pain, they, they, your brain prevents you from going toward those things to get help in times of need because it causes tremendous anxiety. And so one of the things that I had to work through is I had buried what happened to my parents. We were out of bullets and trying to get help for them. I knew every doctor in Charlotte. And it wasn't that they didn't want to help me and help my parents. They didn't know what to do. They didn't have time and they didn't have the expertise. And so we struggled. We struggled. And so when I was looking for strength and when I had had to go through uh, some of the things that I went through with them, my brain wouldn't let me go, go to it. Happens to all of us, and um, I'll, I'll describe that in just a minute. And so I was, um, but one night I was just thinking, um, you know, I've been through some tough times. I've been, I've been through some struggles. And where, where's that strength that I had when I got through it? And then all of a sudden it started to flood back about what I had to do to take care of my parents. And so I had the idea that I would start a clinic taking care of people losing their memories. I went to my wife. I said, Mary, what is this idea? She goes, this is a bad idea. <laughs> she said, sometimes when we do some missionary work and I would be talking to young doctors or, or people that were with us, I would always make the point that all compassion begins with confidence. If you don't have a skill, you can't help someone. They got families to hunt them. But you need a skill, you need to be good at this. And she turned to me and said, you don't have a skill, you don't know anything about this. But their families hug them and said, this is a bad idea. And then she said, what all Irish Catholic wives say to their husband, you've been drinking again. <laughs> so I wrote that letter, and the first sentence in the letter was, when a 65-year-old cardiac surgeon applies for a dementia fellowship, shouldn't it prompt the question, he needs to be in the clinic? Right? So, 
And somehow that sentence caught on. But all three of those places accepted me for um, further training, and, uh, which was amazing. Um, and that time I spent at Hopkins was really, and in the book, I, I give them a, a great deal of credit for helping me uh, get to that point. Um, the last thing that has influenced me recently is that um, I, um, the last two years um, I have spent with um, a group of people that have dominated my brain, and that is the people in the last years and last stages of their life. Um, I call it the late fragment, and it's about people where it's beyond careers, beyond retirement, beyond second and third careers, beyond travel, beyond volunteering, and the next most important thing in your life is going to be your own death. And we are going to try, I'm trying to um, find out how we can sustain ourselves through those years. So that has changed me fundamentally. Um, and I've spent two years with these people. I've interviewed 75 to 100 people. And um, uh, it's brought me, um, I thought at first it was going to be a hands link, semi intellectual um, sort of journey. But I'm going to make a few observations and it's going to be fun. When you write something like this and you get immersed in it, um, what it does is it takes away all the illusions, takes away, and it has been a raw experience because not only do I see a lot of the downside in that period, but I also um, saw myself in that period. So uh, I saw the very sinews uh, of, of life, and some of that I'll talk a little bit about today. Um, well, okay, so back, back to much advice. I realized very early on that there was this giant gap. My, my taking care of the patients and their families with dementia, I began to see that the, um, the process, the pathological process that these people had was very nuanced, but in normal cognitive aging, all it was was an exaggeration of what we go through in normal aging. Okay. It is dramatic, but all of the all of the pressure points are in um, that normal aging that get accelerated in dementia. So I wanted the science to come in to normal cognitive aging. I wanted um, the, the the articles that you read are really good on uh, telling you what happens to the neurons, what happens to amyloid, what happens to all that stuff. But they don't tell you what it does to you and how it changes your perspective and your behavior. And the flip side of that is, if you pick up any pop culture deal, they got all kinds of suggestions for you. You need to do this, you need to do that. And yet, there's no science behind it. So I was hoping with a bunch of eyes that I would put the science. So when you're reading the book, don't, I try to make it as simple as possible, but don't skip over the science, okay? Um, sorry. In the book, I use 10 things that you shouldn't do, the 10 common mistakes in aging. And the reason why I, I began to see when I did a workshop, or we would be talking to family, what, what I, wanted, I, I realized that using um, a negative approach of what you can't do or what you shouldn't do was much more effective than saying, no, you need to do this, okay? Growing up, all right? So I think of my father, and he would say, um, this is a really good plan, Chuck. He said, it's the difference between you're getting ready to go into battle, and your commanding officer says to you, you be careful out there. Okay, I'll try to be careful. What's really effective is they say, one more step, and that's a landmine right there. You got it, okay? You're gonna pay attention. So these negative things have been powerful. And when I have given talks, I always get the, um, uh, the feedback that it works. Um, so tonight, I'm going to use four of these 10. Now, I'm taking the six best ones out. you got to read the book. <laughs> you've got to buy the book. The money goes to the Reverend Center uh, in order to learn about those. All right, mistake number one, underestimating the time left. 
want to start with a staggering statistic. Okay? In the United States today, there are less than 100,000 people that are over the age of 100. Okay? In 2050, there will be 800,000 people over 100 years old. The day that my father was born in 1920, his chances of living to 100 are 1%. The day I was born, 1947, uh, that was a great year, by the way. Uh, the, um, my chances are 3% living to 100. My daughter, Jenny, was born in 1973. Her chances of living to 100 are over 20%. So, um, as you know, the number um, in, in 1900, the average age of an American was 40 years, 40, average age. The average age today for a female is over 80. Now, one thing that's happened with this longevity is that in the last three years, the longevity for an American has dropped slightly. And the reason is because so many uh, young people are dying of fentanyl overdoses. Over 100,000 people died of fentanyl overdose this last year. Pearl Harbor, 9-11, the Jonestown flood, all about 3,000 people. Think of that. The three largest disasters in our history, and we lost 9,000 total. We use that every month from fentanyl. It's unbelievable. All right, so we know that as Americans, we're living longer. But what about an individual? How long am I going to live? So, if you make it to 65, your average age, average lifespan, is 84 years. If you make it to 70, you get one more year. Average lifespan is 85 years. Now, where it really starts to get going here is, if you make it to 80, your average lifespan is 89 years, okay? If you make it to 100, you're gonna make it to 102. So the longer you live, the longer you are going to live. Who makes it? You do. All right? Now, there was this marvelous study that showed us that we have some control over this. It was a study that was published in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2008. It followed 2,357 men, average age 72. And they followed these uh, men from 1981 to 2006, for 25 years. If you were normal weight, non-diabetic, non-smoker, and your blood pressure was under control, and you exercised twice a week, 54% of those men lived to 90. Okay? All right, so now one of the things about the new book, um, that time, it's a gift of time, okay? It's because we have vaccines and antibiotics and we're taking care of ourselves much better, diets a little better. But a lot of that time is gonna be tacked on to the end in that late fragment, okay? We're gonna to have to learn how to negotiate those late years. One thing about longevity in and of itself is not enough, okay? Um, this gift of time, um, think, about, think about time in our lives, okay? We do not sense the passage of time. We don't sense it. We see it when we look in the mirror, or we look at a clock, or we feel it in our joints because we know that we're you know, a little bit creaky, but we don't sense it. In fact, when we do sense it, it is very anxiety producing. Think about this. I'm late, or I've forgotten something. I'm late, I got to go, or I'm running out of time. I'm being timed on a test, and I'm running out of time. When we sense time, we um, are anxious. So, also, one of the things about our inner dialogue that we have in our brains, that we're talking to ourselves, that is so vital, we're going to talk a little bit about that. So vital never ages. That voice is ageless. Okay? Chuck Edwards, he's still jackassing around at the UVA. Okay? Um, 
of and the guy talking to me saying, this ain't gonna work, or this, this is not good, is young, okay? And the old Chuck Edwards ought to pay attention, but we don't. We, we, we have a tendency, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, but we have to, when we are trying to make an interval of time mean anything, that uh, are made a part of time be consequential, we have to step back and actively think about it. And when we really get nervous is when we think about running out of time, running out of that last time that we're not here anymore. But understanding that that's going to happen brings everything else to life. And so that's some of the kind of stuff that's in uh, the new book. Um, all right. Right, what is it we want from this gift of time? I, I selfishly, what I want is an endless sequence of days filled with purpose, love, and joy. Um, I want to have bonds with people and friends and family that are profound, that are visceral, and that I can give love and affirmation to people and they can give it back to me. It's the one sustaining element that's crucial to successful aging. I hate that term, by the way, but when I go, I want to leave a big hole. I want to leave a hole where people say, damn, I'm sorry he's gone. That was a guy, you know, he was trying to do some good stuff. Um, there is a common lament that says, if I can just do this over, we hear this all the time, if I could just live my life over, I could do different stuff. 25 years is a lifetime. We can do it over, okay? We can get a redo. We can atone for some of the things that we didn't do right in those 25 years. But this cost of admission that you got to change. You've got to have a different perspective. Egos have to come way down. Appreciation of other people and what's going on in their lives has to come up. And so, um, so the cost of mission is changing our perceptions, changing our value system. And part of that, of course, is in the book, Much of Eyes. Um, sorry. Getting it right means that this marvelous lives that we have are going to keep going with joy and purpose. Getting it wrong means we're going to be emotionally alone it's going to be a recipe for despair. Muggeridge, uh, the famous, uh, well, he was crazy as hell, but um, uh, he, he wrote a lot of good stuff. He was a late convert to Catholicism, like Colin Roach was. Uh, that, uh, uh, he, he, he said, I was listening to a video of his the other day, and he said, the sunset contains the beauty of the whole day. And so we have to remember that this end of our lives, getting, that's the sunset, and it's going to be the prettiest part of our Common mistake number two, not being aware of the effects of aging on our brains. If you don't know what time and um, uh, aging is doing to your brain, you can't compensate. You can't shift and say, wait a minute, I'm not doing that anymore, that didn't work. So, um, I want to read uh, from the book, Let's see if I, I don't have a lot of life here, but um, I think I can make it. You all know this person. And he was shocked. I had to get his permission. RGB is a 70-year-old friend who frantically calls one afternoon. I'm losing it, and I need to see you right away. My father had Alzheimer's late in life. And I knew this was happening. I got it. I asked him, what's prompted all this? I was with you three weeks ago, and there was no sign that anything was wrong. I don't think this panic button has been around too long. He says, three things have occurred in the past two weeks that have convinced me that I'm definitely losing it. The first two happened on successive nights last week. I often wake up in the night and have trouble going back to sleep. I will go down to the kitchen and eat a bowl of ice cream. I don't recommend that for the summer. <laughs> on this particular night, I left the freezer door open. Sarah came down in the morning and was obviously upset that I had been so careless. The killer was, I did the exact same thing the next night. Now I'm beginning to doubt myself, and she's rolling her eyes and saying, here we go. 
The third clue is the hardest. I have played golf with the same foursome Wednesday afternoons for more than 10 years. We were teeing off and I realized that I could not recall the names of two guys in the foursome. These are my close friends and their names have left me. Gone. Get this, I had to sneak around their car to look at the names on their golf bags. Are you kidding me? I definitely have been uh, slowing down since retiring. I'm not as sharp with names. And forget about new technology. I lost the ability to turn on my TV with a new remote. I had to get my son to come over to turn the damn thing on. He put duct tape over one button and it can't be pushed and the TV can't be turned on. So we got RGB in the clinic and took a careful history, examined him, and uh, sent off the lab that he was perfectly normal. And I, and I gave him the best, best medicine, which was reassurance. But if you don't know that there are certain parts of this journey, certain parts of, of aging, and you don't know it's coming, it's going to panic you, and you're going to think you're losing it. And if there's one thing that you can't remember, if you're anxious, you're not going to remember anything. All right? So here we go. Things that I don't care about in my evaluation of people in their, um, uh, when they come to, to me with this um, uh, evaluation of their memories. The first thing is I don't care about names. Okay? Um, names, our ability to remember names is, is different. Okay, think about this. When you are trying to remember someone's name, you can see their face. You can see everything about them. I remember that guy, he had that sister that was so tough. I remember her the day I died. All right? But you can't remember his name. But it's a moniker, it's an abstraction. And we've lost the ability to do that from age 28 because it comes under a part of our brain called fluid intelligence. It's where we solve problems without life experiences. This is where IQ comes in, when you took that IQ test, okay? The guy that you see walking across the street, he's got his hat on backwards, he's all tatted up, he's gonna sit down next to you and he's gonna blow you away on the fluid intelligence test, okay? Thank God there's a second part of our intelligence called crystallized intelligence. It is what, how we solve problems with life experiences. Our vocabulary gets better, and um, we get better at solving certain problems, okay? So I don't worry about names. Let it go. Usually the name will come back. What you'll see, though, in the dining room, like if, let's say that you're um, at um, someplace having dinner, and someone would come, I remember my father doing this, and someone would come to the door, and he'd go, well, my family and my mom, and he'd go, no, who is that guy? <laughs> and she'd say, I don't know. He said, I think. I don't know, maybe I played golf with him, or he's a prison. I can't remember. So it ruined his dinner, okay? And then he didn't realize when that hey, the guy came up to talk to him, he didn't have any idea who that was, okay? <laughs> so that's the way it works. And it's okay to say, I've had a senior moment. Can you give me your first name? Okay? Don't, don't be embarrassed by that. <clears throat> the second thing is technology. I don't care about technology. Because think about this. Technology comes under fluid intelligence. Technology has changed aging. My grandfather was an Irish Catholic politician from a place called South Boston, Massachusetts. He was a tough guy. Okay? If he walked in here, he would have a Panama hat on, a seersucker suit, those two tone shoes. He was a howling. And everything that he said, and his time with us was so precious that we worshiped him. Everything he said was reverential. And um, he would take us to battlefields. And uh, he used to tell us the story about, you know, we would be in Antietam. And he would say, boys, the, 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 the rebel soldiers were, were dead, stacked up underneath your arms. We were eight years old and six years old. But we remembered all that stuff. Now, as we got a little older, we realized he didn't have any idea what I thought that about. Okay. And one time we were at a battlefield and stopped off and he was telling us about the Rebs and the, the um, Union. And it was a revolutionary war battlefield. So it was sort of. But the point was that every time we were around him, 
everything he said was important. And I still remember a lot of it. Me to my grandchildren, I'm the guy that's not quite as good on the iPad as they are. Or Grammy, give me that phone, I can do that. Okay? So technology has changed their relationship to me. They actually think they're smarter than I am because of that. And who said that there's a button somewhere that should really guess me? So you'll get stuck. Okay, the first thing I do when I get stuck on the computer is yell, Mary! Yeah. She comes in there, and I'll say, I don't know what's happening. And she's like, come in. Get rid of that tone of your voice. I said, all right, all right, all right. just all right. But who said you can't touch that button? Okay, where does it say that you've got to touch that button for the thing to come back up? It's not fair, but I don't care about technology. One of the things also is we're going to make more errors. Um, there's a chapter in the book about super agents. Super agents pick up errors really fast. They will walk into a room and they'll go, something over. Did you see that light bulb in the chandelier? It's out. Super agents pick up errors very fast. But the rest of us who are not super agents do not. And so we are going to make errors in our checkbook. We're going to make errors in uh, other places. I don't care about that. Okay. The, the fact that you've got the wrong key to get into a door or whatever, I don't care about that. Um, what I do care about it is that you're getting ready to get in the car. I want you to sit for about 15 seconds and think about where you're going. Errors in the car are costly. Okay. So you, you, you know that there is a something that goes off. So, oh, I got my GPS, I'm fine. No, you got to know where you're going because if you get surprised, you're going to get in trouble. Okay. Medications. Be careful with your medications because I'll, I'll take this pill. I have one pill, it's a drug ball. It helps with the shape, it also helps with my heart. But I'll forget, I'll get in the shower, I'll come out, and I'll say, Did I take my pill? And I get furious at my patients when they mess up the medications. All right, going into a room, I don't care about this, where you forget why you've come into a room in the first place. <laughs> what you have to do is to go back to the room that you were in, and a trigger will come up. You're, you're putting up a picture, and you needed a longer nail, but you forgot that. So when you go back in, you see the hammer, and you go, oh yeah, I got it. Okay. Now here's the one, here's the one that is, uh, I see patients in their facilities or in their home on, um, on, on Wednesdays. It used, it, it used to be on Thursday, it's all Wednesdays now. And uh, any of y'all know Charlotte, uh, there was a place in Park Road where the Giant G used to be. And there's a coffee shop in the back called Mugs. Okay. So I parked there and I'm getting ready to go to the, to, the, um, um, to the nursing home right there across the creek. I grew up right there, so I know all this stuff. And uh, I come out with my coffee, and um, a caregiver for one of my patients has a little kiosk or a little shop there. And if my patient comes out and says to me, he goes, I know you. Yes, <laughs> you do, Mr. Jones, you know me. He said, high school. We went to high school together. And I said, I'm a memory doctor. And he goes, you're doing terrible. <laughs> So then, so then, he gets in, I get into the car, and I start off, and he comes screaming at me, screaming, he goes, stop, stop, and I go, what? And I roll the window down, he reaches up and grabs my coffee, and he, goes, and he says, you don't know how good this makes me feel. So we're all going to do those things. Hold it lightly. If you are anxious about, about memory, you're not going to remember things. I'm going to skip that just, just a little bit. Um, how are we doing on time? Are we, are we okay? Huh? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Who's going to talk at? <laughs> you got another, you got a headline coming to <laughs> All right. Common state number three. Not realizing that there are five crucial things that can protect your brain. Five. Okay? The 
first is recognizing the late manifestations of depression. Now, so depression is a chemical imbalance of the brain. It can be caused by traumatic life experiences. It can be caused by aging itself. Uh, just the process of aging can drop certain uh, neurotransmitters into the brain. But when you are 22 years old and you're depressed, it's easy to see. Your, your, phys your facial physiognomy, your body habits, it's, you know, that, that poor guy's depressed, okay? Um, he slowed his actions. As we age, the, the manifestations of depression change. It might be simple as someone who's always been very calm and gentle, they all of a sudden develop anger, or they get impatient, or they're distracted. <coughs> it may be something as simple as um, um, that apathy, things that they used to want to do, they don't want to do it anymore. Anhedonia, which is the loss of pleasure from things that used to be great pleasure. We want to be on to something. And if you see that you have a partner uh, or someone that you know, I'm talking about a spouse or partner, and all of a sudden they have become quiet, they are distracted, they are retracted, that oftentimes is a manifestation of depression and uh, it needs to be treated. And sometimes, especially in men, uh, they, they consider um, depression or um, anything where you need a doctor to talk about your brain as a weakness. Okay? It's a weakness. And so I like the way I am. I'm not going to take any medication to make me someone I'm not. Well, all those medications do, and they are successful. They just take the neurotransmitter and push it back to the normal. So we're not going to feel like that we are giving up who we are just because we might get help and depression. Second thing is hypertension. This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you tonight. Hypertension drives memory loss. The most important number in your life is when that nurse and your primary care physician takes your blood pressure. And she goes, oh my gosh, 175 over 93. And you go, oh, every time I come to the doctor, my blood pressure's up here. It's nothing to worry about. Well, that's called the white coat syndrome. It doesn't exist. People that are diagnosed with the white coat syndrome have a higher incidence of heart failure, stroke, and heart attack. So that's when everything stops. You say, my oh, blood pressure needs to come down. There are medications that if we put you on that medication, an AC inhibitor or an ARB, uh, the incidence of dementia goes down. It goes down. There's a famous study, doctors in the room know about it, it's called the Framingham study. Framingham study, they, they, uh, and everybody thinks Harvard did it, it was, it was the NIH. And they adopted a town in, uh, just outside of Boston called Framingham, 1946, I think it was. And they said, at this time, heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, off the charts in America. Um, and so what they said is we're going to study this. They went in and did smoking uh, cessation programs. They put people aggressively on antihypertensive medications. They took their cholesterol down. They were aggressive about diabetes. And what do you think happened? The incidence of coronary related deaths and morbidity went straight down over six or seven decades. All of the recommendations that your doctors make in your primary care physician's office came out of that training and study. Okay. It's extraordinary. What happened then was about in, in 2000 to 2010, they went back and looked at the incidence of dementia over those same decades. And what do you think happened? Each one of those decades, the incidence of dementia went down when you aggressively treat cardiovascular risk factors. So that blood pressure, I want to see the doctor, I want, I want my blood pressure. When you get up into your eight, late 80s, early 90s, I'll take 140, 145, even 150. I'm not taking 170, okay? You're gonna have a stroke or a heart attack. So just be aware of that, okay? The number one marker for cognitive decline in a lifetime is hearing loss. I want to say it again. The number one 
marker <coughs> for cognitive decline in your lifetime is hearing loss, more so than arteriosclerosis, and more so uh, than any genetic uh, factors. So when someone, when you are not hearing well, uh, and you say, well, leave me alone, and then your wife screaming at you, you go, don't yell at me. You know, you, know, you really all go through this, all right? Uh, you go, you get your hearing tested, and then, God forbid, you say, oh, I hate them so many, I don't want to wear it. You're not that good looking. <laughs> Some guy says, oh, I, I don't really want them too vain. One of the ugliest guys I've ever seen in my life. That hearing aid is not going to take away. I'm going to hit it off and believe me. You know, he doesn't have a shot anyway. <laughs> Sleep issue. Very hard later in life. Uh, but now, um, sleep apnea. Insomnia is impossible to treat. Some people sleep well, some people don't. Sleep apnea is treatable, but you have to wear these big masks and stuff. They're doing better. So if someone has apnea, meaning that they are stopping breathing at night uh, for five or six seconds, then they need to have an evaluation <laughs> because every night they're having a hypoxic brain injury. All right, this is the last one. This is kind of tough, but it's important. Um, there are medications that are extremely destructive to memory. Sorry. Some of them are antipsychotics and stuff. We don't need to worry about that. Although there are some psychotic people uh, in this room. <laughs> uh, so, um, but there's a group of medications called benzodiazepines. Um, they are Xanax, um, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, Liberty. They also are to Mesopan and Adivan for sleep. Uh, the, the joke in Hopkins was don't ever put anybody on them. And once they're on them, you can't take them off. Now, there are times when those medications are okay. Uh, because if someone is very agitated and I'm going to take care of them with advanced dementia, and let's say they're in a wheelchair, then, then I can be aggressive. But they cause falls. They also cause significant memory issues. If you come on one of those, they are terrific for anxiety. Xanax makes you high and calm. Who would want to take it all day long? Okay, we just, oh. So if you're on, just discuss it with your primary care physician to get off of it. Gradually, it takes me a year and a half to get some of the fun. All right. Common mistake number four. We've got just a little more time. Allowing negative thoughts and anger to take over your attitude and perspective. This is extremely important because every day, that conversation you have with yourself, you are making choices. I can take this in a positive spin, or I can look for what's wrong with it, and I can have a negative spin. I give the example of a young girl who has a special needs child, and they're late getting on the road and the kids are late for school. She's driving down Park Road, and as a lady in front of her, a little old lady, and all you can see is her gray hair over the very top of the, the uh, seat. And uh, the first reaction on the part of the mother who's trying to get the kids to school is that old lady shouldn't be on the road at this time of day. This is for people who are trying to live lives and get to work. And then uh, she realizes that the bird is pulled over a little bit. She flies around her, flips her the bird, and she's off. Okay? So what she's done is she has flooded her brain full of negative neurotransmitters. Okay? And for the rest of that day, she's going to be on edge, and she's going to see the negative aspects of what's going on in her life. Now, the flip side of that is all of a sudden she stops and realizes and this is out of the ordinary. This lady has actually stopped on the side of the road. She gets out and she sees that her face is moving. She's not moving her right side. And obviously she has a stroke. She goes and gets her children, puts them in the back seat, and they sit with her till the ambulance comes. And, um, and then when she's taught her children as a teacher, that this is how you handle emergencies. Life stops and you take care of the people that need to be taken care of. Something those children will remember. Also, for her, her brain is flooded with 
these neurotransmitters that are linked to mobility, to calmness, and to be able to handle situations. She goes in almost a different person. Okay? If you have a study of Duke, they matched up two identical groups that had a heart cath for coronary artery disease. And afterwards, they asked the question, is, do you consider yourself in good health? And are you looking forward to the future? They split about half and half. The ones that look forward to the future and said, yes, I'm still in good health, lived decades longer than the people that said, no, I'm sick and I'm going to die. Okay. So this positivism is crucial. Um, all right. It's all about chemistry. I want to go over um, five crucial things that are that are are important for you as you age and allow you to hit your stride. Okay, we're going to end on that. The first is the readiness to smile. When I was on vacation, we were in Italy somewhere, and I noticed that uh, we were in a Northern Italy, and um, I noticed that um, Germans, every time they walked into the dining room or something, no smile, they walked in as if someone had taken their, their uh, uh, table or it was going to be bad food or whatever, and the Italians walked in as if this was the last day of their life and they were ready to party. <laughs> and it's hard to think, when you smile, what you're telling the world is you haven't gotten the best of me yet. I got a little tread left on my time. And that conversation that you have with yourself is, I still see the funny part, okay? I'm still in the proximity of joy. What is um, really important is um, that, just see here, um, that when you smile, you can feel the neurotransmitters being forced up into your brain. You can feel it. When your cheeks go up, all those chemicals that are really good for you, all of a sudden you can feel them in your brain. So smiling is key. Even if you don't have anything to smile about, you've got to smile. The second thing is, um, as we age, and this is part of people in the late fight, but um, don't give up. Um, a person with your DNA and your life experiences has only lived once in this entire world. And they're not going to come back. Your story is unique. And we need as much diversity in this world, this diversity of thought, this diversity of uh, perspective. We don't need to squelch people. We don't need to cancel them. We want, I want people to have confidence. I want them to say, I'm unique. I've got an opinion, and I am going to voice it. Um, I want to celebrate when you swim upstream with different thoughts and actions. The world needs for you to speak up. There's a genocide trying to erase this magic of what individuals are. There's a genocide. You aren't supposed to be individuals anymore. You're supposed to move with the crowd. Characters. In the South, we always celebrate characters. There might have been someone that he maybe drank too much, or maybe he you know, had some issues with family or whatever. But uh, he had something else. He might have been a great poet. He might have been a little bit coach or whatever. Nowadays, we look at that person and we judge him. What we need to do is to celebrate. Okay? And we don't have to celebrate the bad stuff. But we have to realize every one of us has good things and bad things. And there are some days you wouldn't want something judging you. It's like Mary said. Some days you know, she'll go, you need to read your own damn book. <laughs> right. Third thing is, be willing to accept new roles. Um, there's a great line in the love song of J. Alfred Kufar by T.S. Eliot, and he says, No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was I meant to be. I'm there to swell a scene, to give advice to the at one time in our lives, maybe we were Prince Hamlet. Maybe we were the president of a bank or a successful lawyer or whatever. We're not there anymore. We have to look for 
new roles to impact situations and to connect with other people in their lives. And if we have that idea that I used to be this person, I used to be on a poor project. No one gives a damn. <laughs> what they're interested in is what you're doing today. Yeah. All right. Characters. All right. And um, the, the last thing, uh, the, the fourth one is um, really important. I see people in all types of stress, um, caregivers, and, uh, counseling people as they age. And one of the things I think is a really important point is the feeling of gratitude for what we have. Okay? Not what we've lost, but what we have. Here, the most people in this room are healthy. If you could follow me for one week, you would come away completely changed and thank God for this marvelous brain you have and the life that you have. And yet I see people grumbling. Okay? They get a steak in the restaurant and they are all pissed off. Okay? My father, um, and, uh, he's in the book, but uh, he was a very calm guy. And so we were in this restaurant one time in uh, New Hampshire and uh, the place was terrible. It was a hotel. It must have been Addison. Um, staffing issues or something, but the food was bad, the service was bad, my mother was fired up. She said, we ought to comply. We ought to really, you know, this is ridiculous. We ought to get a free meal. He said, don't we just come down and say, you know what I love about this restaurant? She said, what? He said, the portions are so small. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we got to do. <laughs> One of the things that lies now, the way that we connect with each other, is through vulnerability. Vulnerability is the is grafted onto humanness. If we try to project the fact that the human condition doesn't affect me, that I've got all this figured out, and that I don't need anybody's help, okay, and I'm not going to show any vulnerability, I'm going to end up emotionally wrong. So that vulnerability of when we are human, that's how we connect. The last thing, and I know that the men and Phillips and Steve are all going to give me a hard time, but the final is that one of the biggest mistakes people make in life is an abnormal relationship with money. Okay? Now, you may start out with no money, and you may have achieved it, or you may have had a bunch of money and lost it, okay? but it doesn't change who you are. Okay? Now, when we used to do this seminar, I used to have, I used to send out these cards, and I would ask the audience, what is their biggest fear? And we would have four or five things. First fear was fear of cancer, fear of dementia, fear of the loss of the spouse, um, fear of running out of money. Which do you think was the number one fear that people had? Running out of money, okay? Now, here's the drill. Brad's gonna take care of your money. They're gonna be conservative. And you say, I want to go around the world, they're going to say, I want you to rethink that. <laughs> they're going to say, you got plenty of money, but you don't have that much of it. <laughs> right, so the drill is that, um, that, that once you have your obsessions, when you get anxious and fearful, obsessions um, are the result of anxiety in your brain. And, they, and what happens is when you become anxious, there's a form of obsession that comes. And we form obsessions. Those obsessions can be with money. And every month when they send you that statement at the end of the month, uh, I haven't looked at that recently, uh, but uh, there's a number there. That number is abstract. It's a mirage if you can't turn it into uh, joy in your life. And so I have people that they have it and they see it and that number's piling up. They've got plenty to weather. That's one thing the brags are good at, is making us feel good about the money we have in the bank and we have enough to survive downturns. But um, if keep enough, but at the end, if you can't turn that into joy in your life, it's a waste. The most important message I'm gonna, what the goal is, is to bounce the check to the undertaker. <laughs> I'm <gonna> stop there. <laughs> <laughs>
that was running across the street and, uh, you know, I almost got hit by a car. And then he bemoans the fact that the guy has to live uh, in a locked unit. Okay? I don't know what his solution would be. I was really disappointed that when he had, and he, that he comes from an Indian family, and they are very patriotic. patriotic. Uh, when he had a chance to work to the end of his life and his father, when he had his final fortuna, they let that thing play out to the very end. So, you know, I, I thought he did a good job of, of phrasing it, um, but I, I didn't think he gave me anything. Um, he didn't have to make the decision that I have to make twice a week on separating or going into a, um, a retirement center or separating a couple. And he would say, oh, that's really sad. Yeah, it's sad, but we got to do it. And so then you, so um, uh, I'd like, he did do one thing. Uh, I, uh, I went to hear it and uh, he described uh, what we call uh, seagulls. Um, we'll have a complicated family situation and uh, we'll have everybody in Charlotte uh, on board with a plane. And then of course someone that hadn't seen their mother for two years and lives in San Francisco flies in, calls the seagulls, and craps all over the plane. That's a seagull. That was a really good thing that he had. But I, I don't want to be too harsh, but I was looking for answers, and I, what I got is this is a problem. I already knew it was a problem. One more. Anybody else? All right. Or is it as a genetic component? Well, you, you sort of procedure. Okay. One, yes, there is a genetic component. It's small. Um, she wanted to know about the, uh, what causes dementia. Um, well, you know, it's not a genetic thing. It's a genetic component. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 What can um, treat it? Um, every one of the major um, drug companies has lost a billion dollars or more in these failed uh, clinical trials. Um, there was one um, sort of ray of light that came about, uh, last week from the University of Virginia that when Jimmy Carter got melanoma, I don't know if you're all familiar with this, but he had metastatic to his brain and all over his body. This is three years ago. And at Emory, they isolated a substance that blocks, melanoma makes a substance that doesn't allow the, your immune system to attack the tumor. And so at Emory, they gave this medication and every bit of melanoma in his brain and in his body went away. Um, and so it released the, um, the body's ability to fight foreign substances. So uh, so at Virginia, they have isolated um, a, another substance which, when it gets blocked, it allows the immune response for these small cells called microglia to attack um, and clean up uh, what's happened in the brain. One of the things that, um, no one's going to like this very much, but uh, one of the things that um, alcohol does, of course, is that it tastes good and makes you feel good. But uh, drinking every day uh, really undermines your ability to sleep. It prevents you from going into those deeper levels of sleep where the microglia can clean up your brain. So I like my patients to, to drink two or three days a week, enjoy it, but I want to have several days a week where alcohol doesn't block that. But that's the first time that I've gotten a little bit excited and we, we follow this every single day. And amyloid, the, the foreign protein in the brain, um, it's kind of like um, you are at the University of Virginia in 1969, and it's a party weekend. And you get up on Sunday morning and you're walking by the fraternity houses. And there's a fraternity house there that all the windows are broken out, the doors have been torn off, and you see about 100 Budweiser cans in the front yard. And you go, 
I wonder what those blood washing cans did to that house. <laughs> That's what amyloid is. I don't think amyloid is the answer. Maybe, but I just don't think it is. Chuck, you wrote about uh, characters who should be celebrated. <laughs> Rest assured, we will celebrate you. Thank you very much.